Welcome to Detective Fans. I am back to cover part four of season four, Night Country. Before I begin, just to let you know, I've been covering every single episode, so make sure to like and subscribe and turn on your notifications as we recap every single episode after it airs. So we are moving right along. We're at part four. I thought there were eight episodes. There's only six, so we're more than halfway done. So we're, you know, I'm expecting things to really rev up the last two episodes, and things really revved up this episode. Uh, we got a new sus uh, suspect, a guy named Otis Heiss. What makes him unique? The thing that makes him unique is he has the same injuries that killed the scientists, you know, the corpsicles. He had the burned retinas, the self-injuries, but the difference is he survived, and he survived for years out in the ice. So the main thing that pops in my mind is who is this guy? Obviously, he worked at the Tassol, uh, Tassol, uh facility before. So is he like a former test subject that got away and he's out for vengeance? Because he's tied into this some type of way. Is he Clark's accomplice or is he just like a deranged person out on his own looking for revenge against the scientists and maybe even the mining company? That's what we're waiting to resolve. Uh, the other key thing that makes me think that he's just another cog in the wheel is that he's obviously a junkie. He has a drug problem. So with drugs impairing your mind, he's not like this focused killer that's looking out for revenge. So if he did these killings, he had to get help doing them. So the other big thing is, you know, with Liz's research, we found out that before the scientists fled the facility, the power was cut. So it wasn't just somebody supernatural, like taking the, um, the lights out or anything. It was somebody deliberately that cut the power that caused this event that freaked out the scientists and had them leave the facility. Now, Clark, I thought he seemed a little shocked, but maybe he was in on it. You know, maybe him and Clark and uh, him and uh, Otis are working together on this. We're going to find out shortly, I believe. I don't think he's going to be getting away. So I'm expecting episode or part five to start with Otis kind of confessing what he knows. He did say that he knows Clark. He said Clark is in hiding somewhere underground. So that leads us to the next thing of where is Night Country? Because Otis did tell Liz that we're in Night Country now, all of us. So we know Night Country is likely this underground ice cave where Amy Kay was killed, where we saw the, the prehistoric well bones that were confirmed by the, the science teacher. So we know this is some real legitimate place where research was being done. So what that tells me is that obviously we have a mining company in this region that's um, at odds against half the community. But more than likely, this underground system was developed by them. It's an underground facility where they were doing research, probably research that was uh, indirectly poisoning the town, which is why they kept it secret, which is why nobody had any documentation or maps of these particular caves of the work that they were doing on. So what that tells me is that Clark is hiding there. In how extensive these caves are, we don't know. But they have to be pretty extensive if you know, you're know you having a bunch of scientists do research there. That's why he's been able to hide out and the hide out. And there's probably a bunch of food down there. So he's probably living the life. Uh, <laughs> and um, he can probably live there for years on end if no one found out, if, if Otis didn't make this confession, he probably would have stayed there for years and um, just rode out the uh, manhunt and been able to get away. So now that it's been exposed, now we're going to find out in the next episode probably how deep the research goes, exactly what they were doing down there that Annie Kay discovered and that preceded her being killed. Uh, it had to be something blockbuster that would have destroyed the reputation of the mining company, and that's why Andy Kay was silenced. Now, that still doesn't let us know whether Clark was in on Andy Kay getting killed or not. Um, I'm still on the fence about that, whether he was racked with guilt, and which is what I'm kind of thinking probably is the case, because he mentioned, um, you know, before the lights went out in the first episode, she's coming. So I think in his mind, he's haunted by the ghost of Annie Kay because he couldn't protect the woman that he loves. And he sided with the mining company because he was still working with working there. And he was holding all this guilt inside. Now, whether his uh, penance 
in his mind was killing his fellow scientists and bringing Otis in for the job. I don't know, but that's kind of what I'm leaning towards now a little bit more than what I previously thought. My previous theory was that there were people from the actual community that found out about this and they were the ones that killed the scientists. But now it seems like it's more so probably Clark and Otis that put this whole thing into motion. Um, now, the next thing I wanted to cover would be the supernatural aspect of what is Night Country. I think there's a big thing there because we saw what happened with Ange and what happened with her, her sister Jules passing away. So Night Country to me, as far as the, the metaphysical supernatural aspect is, how do you respond when your worldview is shattered, when everything you believe is true is just ripped apart from you? You know, your foundation as a human being, your morals and ethics, everything is turned upside down. How do you respond and how do you continue on after that? And I think once you had that shattered within you, now you're in night country. Now you're in complete darkness. Now you have no one to turn to. How do you survive that? And we're seeing that with all the characters. I think when the, when Otis said we're in night country, he just wasn't talking about himself, Liz and Ange. He was talking about everyone we've seen in Ennis. So that includes Hank, that includes Pete, um, everyone. And we can start with Hank. Hank is in Night Country because he got scammed by this, we don't even know if it was a woman, out in Russia that he thought was going to be his uh, male or the bride that just scammed him for all that money. So he's complete, feeling completely alone and unloved. And now he's trying to crawl back to his immediate family and his son Pete and Pete's life to try and get some semblance of family that he lost from his wife abandoning him. So he has nothing at this point. His worldview is shattered. Pete's on the way of getting his worldview shattered because he's putting all of his um, love and his maternal, his um, yearning for maternal love onto Liz who can't give that to him. And that's coming at the expense of his family, at the expense of spending time with his son and his child's mother. So pretty soon, if he doesn't get his act together, he's going to lose them because she seems like she's at his wit's end and she's going to end up leaving him the same way his father lost his mother. So that's putting Pete in the night country. Uh, Ange is in night country because she's lost the final person that she loved in Jules. Jules succumbed to mental illness and committed suicide. She's completely gone now. And that was the last thing that was seemingly holding Ange together. And now that she's lost Jules, she is feeling hopeless. She's turning completely to the darkness of feeling like, I don't have any autonomy over my life. I just need to submit to the darkness. My whole family line is cursed. I'm going to follow the same path my mother did and the same path that my sister did. So she's falling completely forward too. So that's what put Ange in Night Country and her version of Night Country. Liz, her version of Night Country is she is just terrible with people. Like, you know, her, uh, the Captain Ted, Ted Connolly told her. You're a great cop, but you're terrible with people. And when you experience that loss, which is the key thing, it made you even worse. We're getting more allusions to what that loss is. Um, I believe the um, the young son, son's name was Holden, the one that was the owner of the uh, teddy bear with the one eye or the polar bear with one eye. So something happened. Either it was an illness, some type of accident uh, where she lost her son. And that put her in complete darkness. And she's been in night country seemingly for years now, pushing everybody away that could have loved her, Ange, um, destroying Pete and his relationship. Um, she has no one that wants to work with her or wants to connect with her, ruining marriages all over Ennis. So that's what's put Liz in her version of Night Country. So all these people are just isolated and alone and just have no type of hope for the future. But there is someone that's kind of giving them a hope about how you can get out of Night Country or how you can even thrive in Night Country. And that would be the character of Rose. And Rose is very interesting. We got a little bit more backstory about her when she met with um, Ange. You know, this is Christmas uh, Eve. Everybody's seemingly estranged from their families. Rose is by herself, but she's comfortable by herself. Why is that? You know, she's revealed that she used to be a professor. She was in the academic world, doing writings, everything an academic would do in their careers. And just one day she woke up and said, this is empty. 
you know, this is meaningless for me. And, you know, for a lot of people, that would be an existential crisis. You know, I spent my whole life being an academic and I'm, I'm unfulfilled. You know, what is the purpose of my life? Some people never get over that. Even in the Bible, you look at Ecclesiastes. That book talks a lot about life feeling meaningless and things like that. A, a biblical book at that, which is wild. But with Liz, she doesn't have that type of um, angst because she realized when she got to Ennis, there is peace that she can find in the stillness of just listening and observing the world around you. And she got in touch with this whole spiritual realm. And even though she's seeing ghosts and everything, like everyone else did, like Jules is seeing, like Anne just starting to see now, it doesn't, there's no fear in her because she realizes that this is just all part of the process of living. And she feels that she's found her purpose and she's happy being in this environment. And that is totally different from everyone else. So Rose is comfortable in that country, comfortable in her skin. And she finds happiness in her own little ways. Even though she's by herself, she created a whole big Christmas Eve spread, got dressed up just by herself and is having a great old time, invited Ange over. So she doesn't feel alone, you know, even though, you know, probably if she had kids and all that, they're all gone. She feels comfortable by herself and does not feel alone and doesn't feel like a tragic figure. And then you juxtapose that with um, Ange, you know, even after losing Jules, she's looking at Kavit, the one person that still loves her, you know, despite the way she pushes them away and everything. He told her that you're not alone, even though she tried to say, I am alone. He's seen her at her absolute worst. You know, this is complete rock bottom, emotionally broken, beat up in the face, lost a tooth, and he's not going anywhere. He still loves her. He still would do anything for her. So for her to say that she's alone, is wild. You know, you have someone that loves you completely for who you are, literally right in front of you. And that goes back to, I believe, the biggest flaw of a lot of people that are stuck in that kind of night country angst is that not realizing the path out or the path to happiness is right in front of you. You know, in Liz's case, you know, she's so broke up about what happened in the past She's not, you know, and even, you know, the big incident we found out is her praying for her mother to get better and it not happening. And that spiritually broke her. You know, she's getting signs from the other world that your son is trying to communicate with you. How can you not make the connection of a literal one eye polar bear coming up to your car, not aggressive, looking you dead in the eye for anyone that has any type of awareness? you would make that connection with that and the fact that you've been holding on to this one-eyed polar bear in your house. But to me, that symbolically just shows you that, you know, normally the answers are simple and right in front of us if we can just get out of our own way, if we can just put our pain away for just a second to just evaluate where we can go or how we can move forward in our lives, we would find the answer. So a lot of um, existentialism in this episode uh, heavy, but not completely heavy. You know, it didn't really interfere with the plot. There was, you know, a lot of uh, dialogue in some scenes, but it wasn't over long as we may be used to a true detective. You know, even the scene with um, Ange and Liz talking about praying, it was only a couple of minutes. You know, they weren't going on for five and 10 minutes going back and forth about the purpose of prayer and how it failed them and how in Ange's case, she, she's having doubts now about whether prayer even works. You know, before she said prayer helped her because she sat there and listened. But now with Jules being gone, you know, now she's feeling broken and now she's succumbing to that same mental illness that took away Jules. I will say one thing. Um, I think the death of Jules didn't hit as hard. And I think a lot of that has to do with the length of this season. You know, like I said before, I thought we had eight, eight episodes. We only have six. So with six episodes, somebody's going to get shortchanged somewhere. And I think really Jules's character and development, you know, we know her motives and what she's dealing with, with feeling, you know, seeing the ghosts and feeling like they're pulling her away from the living, trying to have her uh, join them. But I feel it didn't hit as hard. I feel like if we had maybe one or two episodes more to kind of delve into that, uh, see and trying to pull her back from that, you know, visiting the facility more and things like that. I think it would have hit more, but to have her get taken to this facility and then literally just walk out and pass away, you know, it didn't hit as hard as I thought it would if we had maybe another episode of development there. 
But overall, I'm very excited where things were going. Um, I'm going to stick with my theory that for now, I'm thinking Clark and Otis are the ones behind the um, scientists dying. And I'm going to say that Clark did it out of guilt for not saving Annie from the, the mining conspiracy. I think Annie Kay's case is due to the mines. I think, you know, the mining company killed her, you know, to keep secret whatever they're doing in these uh, ice caves. Uh, which is probably just harvesting the ancient DNA from the um, the uh, prehistoric whale bones. So we know it's not King Jador, there's no Godzilla thing going on. These are just prehistoric fossils that they're tapping into. But still, you know, how did Annie K get down there? I'm assuming that um, Clark must have told her about these maps and told her what they were doing down there. And she went there on her own, and that's how she got caught. So we're going to go with that theory. But um, that's all for Night Country. You know, we're already at episode four. So we're going to see where things are going to be going uh, for these final two episodes. I'm expecting them to be action-packed. Uh, final thoughts about anything? I think one of the best scenes this episode would be uh, Tagat, the guy that they went back to the the uh, camp to try and locate and he's completely gone now. I thought that was a very eerie scene. It kind of reminded me of um, Twin Peaks episodes when some of the characters would disappear and never show up again. The fact that his whole outfit was there, the gun was there, and everything was frozen. And the only thing that was left was really the stones with the um, spiral symbol. Very eerie, very well done. And then when they come out of the um, out of the house, the um, the native men are there. The dogs are recoiling from the uh, the appearance of the spiral. I thought that was a very creepy scene, probably the most well done uh, of this episode. Also, them going to the dredge and um, trying to locate Clark. I thought that was very well done, too. You know, when you looked at the dredge from the, you know, which is basically just an overturned ship, it didn't look as ominous until they went inside there. And then you see how big it was. So now you're thinking that that dredge may connect with the underground facility. That's some other thing I'm worried um looking into as well. So overall, good episode. We got two episodes left. I want to hear your theories. Do you think I'm completely off with this whole Clark and Otis thing? Do you think it was some of the native community that killed the scientists? Maybe even the mining company themselves. Maybe they're you know cleaning up loose ends and kind of felt that they needed to just have a clean slate and get rid of all the scientists. But the good thing is we're going to find out shortly. Two more episodes left. Like I was saying, make sure to like and subscribe and turn on your notifications. And I will see you next week to cover part five of Night Country. Two episodes left. Take care and enjoy the rest of your Sunday night.